Welcome to the Spark session. Uh, it's, we're trying out a new system this time because GoToWebinar has not proven to have the capacity to do what we need to do, which is talk to you, take your questions, and also have a recorded video at the end. It will record the audio, but not the video. So this is a new system we're trying out called Zoom. Would love your feedback on how the audio quality is and the video quality is. We had used GoToWebinar in the past just because it is something that everybody's very familiar with. It's very stable video-wise. The video quality isn't that great. So hopefully this will be a better system for all of us to use. If you have feedback on it, please email it to Nicole at sparkfreedom.org. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the DNA of a story with Kevin Kerr of Arrowhead Consulting. He works with Spark Freedom to help organizations personalize their policy battles and really put an emotional face on what they're doing so that they can better connect with more people. Now, as we go, we can take your questions. We're going to answer them mostly at the end. But the way to ask a question, look towards the bottom of your screen. If you hover over, it should have a Q&A button. It also might be at the top, depending on which browser you have. If you click on that, you can submit a question there. If you submit one through chat, I might not see it. But if you put it in the Q&A se section, then it should be fine. And don't forget, our next Spark session is August 25 at 12 p.m. Eastern. And that's going to be another Ask the Expert se session. So you can submit any question you want, and we'll forward it to, to one of our experts. We already have one question in about the best way to allocate your advertising dollars to Sue Zoldak. So we'll be hearing from her, but we could use a few more questions from all y'all, so to speak. Anyway, with that, I want to say, hey, welcome to the show, Kevin Kerr. Good morning, Nicole. Thanks for letting me come in. Why don't we start by you telling those of us who haven't interacted with you in one of your wonderful work sessions a little bit more about yourself and Arrowhead 3 and how you help organizations put a story to their policy. Okay. Well, just briefly, the, my organization is just going on to its 10th year, and we help organizations that have very complicated or difficult to describe products or solutions, and organizations like Johnson & Johnson or in the oil and gas space or high tech companies around the world. And a few years ago, we got involved in the freedom movement and selling policy is a very difficult thing as well. And since then, I think Nicole, you and I've done probably 40 or so multiple day work sessions where we've helped them to craft out their story around their policies. Isn't that about the number? Yeah, at least 40. And we have wonderful story packages with a lot of those. So can you tell us why we're talking about story today? All right. Well, this, these are the type of people that we're normally talking to. And I've seen all too often new policies presented to warm-blooded Americans in a cold and lifeless manner. And many times getting lost in the web of wonkery, they fail to answer the most vital questions. I've seen school choice presented in terms of EITCs, ESAs, and vouchers, and not leading with a concerned parent whose child is not getting the education that they deserve or need simply because they live in a different zip code. I've seen folks fighting the dark money argument by explaining the different difference between a Form 990 and a Schedule B form, and along with federal overreach, and not leading with a grassroots organizer who was shut down by a state election board because they spent a few hundred bucks on homemade signs protesting the local development. I've also seen federal, I've seen pension reform um, presented in terms of defined benefit versus defined contributions or ARC payments instead of the public employee losing their retirement altogether if the state doesn't make the payment or they spend it in some other way. Or Nicole, you've probably seen this in other ways in your own life. Maybe it's when you're talking to a financial planner or an insurance agent or a doctor. So let's say an insurance agent. You're sitting down with them. They start explaining terms to you that just make no sense. And then until they say, 
All right, Nicole, let's assume you're a safe driver. You have a nice car. You seldom if ever get into an accident. So you can offset your financial risk by paying a lower monthly premium in exchange for paying a higher deductible whenever you might get into an accident, which you probably won't very seldom. So these story examples, whenever you're talking to these folks, help to put context around sometimes they're very technical products. You know, it does happen to us. And, and the funny thing is it happens to us when we're talking to organizations about the very services we provide for helping people personalize their policy and personalize their organizational brand. It's, it's pretty funny. We'll explain, well, we walk you through a strategic review of your strategic plan or help you develop one and then set your strategic marketing position. Crickets. Until I'm able to tell a story of how somebody we've worked with has used that to further their policy or further their organization's success, it's really hard to make sense of that. It actually reminds me of back in the 90s when I was working with startups, uh, software startups, we would have somebody come in for advice on how to promote their new tool. And it would sometimes take me three weeks of playing with it to figure out what problem it was even solving. So it's, it's funny when I've read, uh, is it Chip and Dan Heath made the stick when they talk about the curse of knowledge? I think we all suffer from that. So it's, it's funny to, to think about those situations where, where I myself am confused by a confusing or lifeless message. So, so Kevin, when you think about story, how do you define story? What is story? That's a great question. Story is one of the most overused and least understood terms out there. A lot of people like to use the term story because it gives it this emotional feel, but they really don't break it down and say, what is story or give you the much less give you the tools and how to use it. To me, story is pretty simple. It's one, two, and three. And there's a lot of research to back this up. So it's really made up of three things. An interesting hero on a mission against some kind of conflict. These three things form the DNA of all good story. All good story have these three things. If you don't have these three things, then you're just describing a set of events or it's just boring narration. A story must have a hero that you're interested in. That hero must be doing something very important to them or trying to do something important to them, and there needs to be some type of conflict standing in their way. And as you see can, from that visual, it has an arc where going from left to right, that is time, but as you go up, that's tension. So you want to have tension in your story. And notice it just goes up and it ends. That's the basis for all good stories, these three things. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit more. Uh, the word hero jumps out at me right now. And, and thinking about the last few weeks in, in world news, all of the things that have happened, we've heard lots of stories about hero. And, and I think when you use that word, you mean more protagonist. So can you clarify for us what you mean by hero when you say hero? Because the word hero is much easier for me to remember than protagonist. Yeah, so the hero is the protagonist in the story. It's the one you have feeling for. The hero is the person who your policy is trying to help. The hero is not the legislator who gets it enacted. It's not the policy itself. This goes back to Joseph Campbell's uh, great book of The Hero's Journey, where he talks about the hero is that person that's on the journey. So you need to keep in mind, for you, the hero is the person you are trying to help with your policy. And that sometimes that's a real nuance for some people to think about that. Yeah, you know, it really can be because I feel like I want to be the hero when I'm fixing people's problems, but the people whose problems I'm helping them wish with are usually the ones that I can tell the best story about, don't you think? Yeah, you are just a supporting character in their story. And so don't try and make the policy or yourself the hero. You're trying to elevate them through the use of your policy. So then let's talk about mission and conflict. What are those two pieces? How, how do those differentiate from each other and how do they fit into the story? So a hero is trying to get something done. 
but mission is a little bit different. Mission is where something has happened in their life that has set them off kilter. They're unsettled. And now because of that unsettlement, they're trying to change it. They're trying to get something done. And there's a lot of passion. And this is the mission. And then there is something that stands in their way. So, for example, a public employee, let's say in the pension reform discussion, the mission might be their life is just fine for right now until they see a news article about what's happening with public employee pensions in Detroit. Now, that inciting incident unsettles them. Now that they, now their mission is, I need to make certain that my pension is safe in my state. And then the conflict is, they're seeing that their state is not making the ARC payments. And they're concerned that the money is going to be there for them when they retire. So that's a very standard hero mission conflict. Okay, that really helps clarify it for me. Uh, before I ask you my next question, I do want to remind people who have joined us after the kickoff, if you have a question to ask that you want to cover at the end, please click on the Q&A button and put it there rather than in chat, just so we can have it all organized in one thing. And we do invite you to submit your questions. Okay, with that, Kevin, I'm, let's just use our fantasy here. I'm a think tank. I want to fix taxes. How do I find my policy story as opposed to my policy solution? Well, there's, a, there's several questions. There's a dozen or so questions that you and I use in our business to help folks find their story. But if you really want to narrow it down, there's three critical questions that unmask your hero mission and conflict. And here's what they are. Number one, what problem are you trying to solve? And that's, it's, it's interesting talking to some policy people, you ask them that question and they will sometimes give you a deer in the headlight stare. But really, what mission are you trying, or what problem are you trying to solve? That typically will unmask the mission. The second question is, who are you trying to solve it for? Of course, that will unmask the hero or a set of heroes that you then need to pick from and figure out which one's the most, the best one to tell the story. And then third, what stands in your hero's way? What kind of conflict is, pre is preventing them? And I love Robert McKee, the man who wrote the book Story, who's trained lots of screenwriters, artists, and directors. And his quote is, conflict is to story as sound is to music. Conflict is to story as sound is to music. So do not be afraid to venture into the conflict and walk deeply in it because it will elicit a lot of emotion and pain that will help you to sell your policy. Well, those seem like three very deceptively simple questions, but even when we go through them for our new products, we sometimes can spend weeks arguing about what the problem is that we're really solving. So that, I like the way you break it down so easily, but it's, it's also deceptive. Um, okay, so what happens if my policy solution does not solve the problem that the person I'm trying to help has? What do you mean by it doesn't solve a problem? Well, I mean, like, let's say I want tax reform and the person I'm trying to help um, only gets $27.93 back in their pocket at the end of the year. So it's not like, and they're really poor and they can't afford food and they can't even pay their rent and it doesn't really solve their problem, which is that they don't have enough money. So that word problem, you can substitute this little phrase for the word problem and that is needs pains and desires. So think about what need or pain or desire are you solving or trying to fill? But just the, the pain or the problem is the most, most acute. It's the thing that'll get action done the most. So for example, I might like to rub my hands with a lotion or put it in the warm water because it feels good and I'll get around to it at some point, but if I put my hand over a hot flame, I'm going to move that immediately. So if you can find the pain point or the problem, that's going to make your, your policy that much more urgent to get things done. So if you're, if you're not really mapped to a problem, go try and find one, or you may not have a very strong policy. Is it ever possible that 
rather than the policy's not strong, we've defined the problem wrong or yeah. the target. Yeah, it's very, it's very much the case. In fact, that's one of the great things about story is the story becomes a simulator. And you then use the story to simulate various scenarios to determine, okay, this problem wasn't strong enough for this hero. Let's try this hero. Or maybe it's not this problem or this mission. And so you're trying different things. You're talking with each other until you feel like you've got the right story to accompany your policy. So, yeah, it's a great tool to be a simulator for your policy. Somehow I'm having a flashback to driver's education in the 80s right now. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so I've often heard you describe this, your capsule of a story that you've just laid out to us so simply, uh, which you call story DNA, as log lines. So what do you mean by log lines? How do they fit into what we're doing here? Okay, so log lines are really cool because they're compact, they're tight, they're, they're structured. And a lot of times we like to have a structure so we can follow. And the term log line comes from the movie industry. So let's say, Nicole, you're Nicole Spielberg. You're, you're this famous producer. Yeah. And you have a room full of screenplays. And I'm a screenwriter. And I want you to take, make a movie out of my screenplay. Well, you've got hundreds of screenplays sitting in front of you. You're not going to read each one, and it's 150 pages. What, what you're going to do is you're going to look on the spine where the author has put a sentence or two of what the story is, and that is the story's log line. And that log line, if it's interesting, you may then pick up that screenplay and read it and then make a movie of it. So movies, books, famous stories, they all have log lines. In fact, let me show you some famous log lines, and let's see if you can guess what the movie is. Good? Sounds good to me. Okay, so first, a washed up boxer gets a chance to fight the world champ, but with the help of his lover, he must learn to believe in himself before stepping into the ring. Ooh, I'm old enough to know this one. And is it, it Rocky? is. Rocky, very Ooh. good. I never Ooh. know movies, so that will be the only one I'm successful at. So we've color coded these things so that as you look at the log line, you can tell where the blue is the hero, the green is the mission, and the red is the conflict. How about this one? A Parisian rat, that gives it away right there, teams up with a man with no talent to battle convention that anyone can cook. We all know. the cats. No. Ratatouille. How about this one? In a future, in a future where criminals are arrested before crime occurs, a despondent cop struggles on the lam to prove his innocence for a murder he has not yet committed. Great movie. I just saw this a while ago. Minority Report. And let me do one more. Transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first woman she meets and teams up with three complete strangers to do it yet again. Who is that? The Wizard of Oz. See, well, log that actually, that's a really good thing you did there. It shows you that you can do log lines from different perspectives and have a totally different outcome. So it sounds like when working on a log line, you want to spend a lot of time being careful about your wording. Is that, is that, would you say that? Yeah. In fact, the book that I'm writing right now, we, we explore how you can take a log line and you can make the log line be very inspiring or it can be very condemning it can be, um, you can do a lot of different things just in how you phrase the log line. And this is a good example how the hero appears to be evil, but yeah, depending upon who you are, she might be. But well, yeah, it's a very flexible. I hope not. That'll destroy all my childhood uh, hopes and dreams from this story. Oh, NEM, NEM. Okay. Well, I see how this might work for movies, but how does it apply to policy projects? Okay, yeah, that's what everybody wants to see. Yeah, that's all good here, but how does it help in policy? We've been doing a lot of work with some folks that are battling the dark money argument. So all of us love it when we're called dark money, and many times we bring out the form 990 and Schedule B to describe 
why protecting donor privacy is so important. In fact, what was interesting, Nicole, in this work, um, they came up with two heroes. So if you, if I say the phrase protecting donor privacy, who would you expect to be the hero in that story? The donor. Yeah. And so they put together several log lines, imaginary log lines about a donor. And what they found is they also did log lines around grassroots supporters. And they found that as they ran through the story, that simulator, they realized that the donor stories, although they might be true and very effective, they just weren't, they didn't elicit the sympathy and concern from the people that they were trying to talk to. So they then decided to go with grassroots supporters. So then they went out using that model and found many stories. They vetted them and looked at them until they came up with some of these. So here's some of the logline stories they're using in this argument. There's Samantha, Samantha Paulusi. She's a 16-year-old girl, Philly high school girl, who was harassed by her teacher and compared to the KKK for wearing a T-shirt with a presidential candidate's name on it. Then there was Benji Backer, a politically active high school student, was publicly shamed and bullied by his teacher for simply sharing his political views in local newspapers, radio, and TV. Then there was Dinah Galassini. And when the government found out that this concerned taxpayer, Dinah, gathered neighbors to protest a spending increase, they forced her to register with the government and to report the cost of poster board and markers. Essentially shut her down. And then there was Diana Shea. This is one of my favorites because this is somebody that's on the left. And using this argument from somebody that's on the left helps us to cross the aisle. So this woman rights advocate educated her Facebook friends about the ballot initiative and ended up in court with the government that targeted her for expressing her opinions online. So all these stories became very powerful ingredients that they would then lead with. And when they use these stories, the turn from not concerned to concern moved the numbers a lot by using these stories. Yeah, it seems to me like they had to connect the stories to why somebody would want to even protect their privacy and how if you have rules for big donors, it affects the small donors who are just putting their, donating their time and a little bit of money. Yeah, exactly. And did you notice how when you have log lines and they're tight and you know your stories, you can either tell one story and expand on it or you can use several of them and chain them together into a story chain and really make for a powerful argument. That's really neat. I like, I like how they have different perspectives too. So it's, it's not just a right problem. It's a right and left problem. Yeah. And this, Nicole, this, Nicole, this is really what we're saying is put a warm face on your policy, make it humane and you can do that. And now people are passionately engaged with your policy. Boy, I remember one of our first clients way back in the day, I think it was 2011, we worked with Taryn Bragdon at FGA, and they were working really hard on the Medicaid policy reform, and in a work session, I mean, was it in Dallas? Yeah, yeah it was Dallas. Uh, so he, he came up with just a new perspective on who was helped and, and related to, uh, he, he named this fictional person Jackie. Mm -hmm. And and Jackie, he defined as well. Who would who's going to really be helped by the reform besides taxpayers, which are not a very sexy hero? Um, and he defined her as a single mom with diabetes and not a lot of income, just struggling through the system. And he used her profile to go in search of potential real stories. So he came out of the session with this fake person, and it's hard to tell a story about a fake person and convince anybody. But he, he was driving to work one day. He looks up on a billboard for a private services provider who can function within Medicaid under a very small test program they had going on in Florida, triple amputee named Moise Brutus. And so he didn't find a single mom with diabetes. He found a young man who'd been in a motorcycle accident and 
lost two legs and an arm and with his last remaining arm was able to reach over, pick up his phone, call 911, and then woke up in a hospital missing his limbs with no hope for life. And, and in the traditional Medicaid system, he would have been left in a dark room on psychotropic drugs to die. But by a tweak or an accident, he was enrolled in this private option they have. And because of that, he was able to spend less money to get better services. And today he's, I, I don't know if he's still training for the Paralympics in 2016, because it is 2016. Uh, but he's also finishing up his degree to become a medical advisor in the same system and help other people like him. So, you know, he may end up off Medicaid in the long term just no. because he's because he was put into a different option. Yeah, Ter Taryn's story there is a great one for us. It, it helped me understand the important concept, and that was you have a story progression, and you first have to imagine. You have to have an imaginary story. And, and folks in the freedom movement were very resistant to this. Oh, I can't tell a story if it's not true. And yet we have to have a vision. We have to have an imaginary story to help us get our heads around. And so he came, they came up with this Jackie story. And then from that, they used it to find these potential stories, these anecdotal stories. And then from that, they interviewed all the different folks to come up with the real stories and that Jackie to Moise and I, I've got a, uh, you know, there's the visual of Jackie who they came up with and her log line. And then that came up, enter Moise Brutus and, you know, Moise Brutus, here's his log line, 24 year old triple amputee in the bike accident, traditional Medicaid, like you had said, and wanted to live a normal, healthy life, get better medical care and have some kind of a purpose. And this guy would then travel the country with Taryn whenever Taryn was talking about traditional Medicaid. Now, think about the powerful story that's told when this kid comes in, triple amputee, comes in, testifies, tells his story, and how the traditional Medicaid didn't work, but the reformed Medicaid did. How would you like to be the guy on the other side of the aisle that had to debate or follow this? It's a powerful well, I can word. tell you from experience, none of us want to be on the other side of that because that's where we are whenever we're talking about cutting, you know, changing welfare systems, right? Is yeah. all of a sudden this poor person who really needs it is there and they're saying, but what about Sue? So we're saying, but what about Moise? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so Kevin, once we have log lines ready, what can we do with them? How can we make them into the best impact for our policy? Well, there's a lot of different things that you can do with them. And I mean, I'm writing a whole book about this that I hope to have out here soon. And, but log lines, as we had mentioned, when they're tight, they can be strung together into a story chain. These are very powerful. It's like a nail gun putting the lid on a coffin in your argument. And you can also take your log line as a simulator to help determine, do I have the right policy? Am I wording it right? Am I talking about the right person? Or you can also take that log line to inspire somebody. Or if you need to condemn some action on someone's part, you can use the log line to condemn a philosophy or a way of doing things. The other thing that's really nice is policy or uh, log lines and stories make your policies contagious because other people will now carry them. And instead of you having to tell the policy or describe the policy all the time, these stories are contagious and people will go out and start telling the Moist Brutus story. And it makes your policy humane, emotional, and it helps people to connect with it. And I like how it stirs the passion of your coalition. And when people get around a story, they get emotionally involved in it, and it tends to get people going in the same direction as opposed to describing it in many different ways. And a lot of times people will say to me, are you just telling me I need to get rid of all the technical things and I call the wonkery? No, I think the wonkery is very important. But if you lead with wonkery, you're going to confuse the person you're trying to persuade. But if you start with the story, you give a context. Now, this, the right selected wonkery 
makes it very credible and very believable. But don't lead with your wonkery. Lead with a well-selected story like a log line. That's really funny you say that. I was, I was at Freedom Fest last week and interviewed on the radio. And, of course, the question comes up, what does Spark Freedom do? Which, you know, many of us are faced with that question, and it's like deer in headlights. And I led with the Moist Brutus story. Oh, did you? I was like, they're going to ask me this question and I'm going to blather on about strategic marketing and coaching and helping people connect story and develop their message and launch it. And, and the poor radio host is going to be like, why did I invite this lady on to my show? She's making my people go to sleep. So, you know, we, we decided the moist story was the one I'm most confident talking about. And so we started there. It's all about confidence in that situation. Yeah, I'm proud of you. But, you know, I was struck by, we're, we're, you've been using a lot of this in your Arrowhead Accelerator series and Arrowhead Creation. When, when do you think your book will be ready so we can read about it in the privacy of our living rooms? Well, my co-author Kelly Shaw and I are working on it right now, and we're going we're gonna to carry on the storyline that we had in the first book of the Arrowhead with Miles and his uh, mentor, Ted. And that storyline will progress. You'll see some new characters come in. And throughout that story, you'll see how these tools are used and then explained through the storyline. So I'm hoping to have that out by the end of the year. Great. We're looking forward to, to that. And as we begin to wrap this up, what, what would you like everybody here to take away? How can they get in contact with you? That sort of thing. And then we'll take questions from the audience in the Q&A screen. Okay. So, folks... Please, 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 please put a face on your policy, a warm face. Start to tell the story, the power of a story, putting a face on your product, inspiring teachers and speakers and leaders use these time, things all the time, but sometimes we don't always give them credit. So folks, put a face on your product. Ask yourself the story questions. If you don't know your story, what problem are you trying to solve? Who are you solving it for and what stands, stands in your hero's way? And then use imaginary and potential stories to find the real ones and get others to carry your stories for you. Great. Well, thanks, Kevin, so much. And as a reminder, if you have a question, just put it in the Q&A tab. We already have a few in. And I'll read those to everybody in a, in a second. Um, also, if you're interested in participating in an Arrowhead Accelerator, they run about two days and we basically boot camp you on an already developed message and arrowhead with stories that have already been found. So we have one on jobs, uh, creating jobs in a better way in August. That's already full, but I believe around November 28th ish. So the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, we will be doing one either on protecting donor privacy or education savings accounts, or maybe jobs again. So if you're interested in that, just uh, shoot me an email at Nicole at sparkfreedom.org or sign up for our email list because, of course, we'll tell everybody when that date has been confirmed. We're waiting a little bit to hear about specific days of events around there. And it will be in Washington, D.C. because Alec has uh, an event that week. So if you're going to Alec, that's a good way to tag on a little bit of learning. So, Kevin, I'm going to ask you the first question, which comes from Frank in Oregon. Um, what do I do if my policy reform's never been enacted so I can't find a story about somebody it's helped? Okay, great question, Frank. And that's a struggle for a lot of people. So that's where you need to go to an imaginary story. What do you hope to gain with that policy? So if you were to imagine the ideal citizen or the ideal story you would tell, what story would it be? What kind of problem are you looking to solve? How does the policy then affect them? And then how does it ultimately help them? And then you tell that vision, get people to buy in. You might find that in other states, policies like this were enacted and you might need to borrow from other states stories that were there. And here again, if it's something completely new, you sell the vision. Like Steve Jobs did when none of us knew what smartphones were. He told us, imagine you could with these devices and sold us all on the iPhone or smartphones. Okay, good advice. You know, it, it, actually the donor privacy situation has a parallel here, right? Where we are not required to disclose our donors yet. 
Um, but in political giving, you are, and people have been harassed there. So there's a parallel in a different policy. But also, you can tell those potential stories where small groups of activists have been forced to report all sorts of stuff to the state, and it gets out, and then they're bullied. So I also think when you have a hypothetical situation, you can tell the horrible potential outcomes and then find parallels, but you have to be really purposeful about connecting the potential story, linking that to the potential outcome of this new policy and make it clear that, okay, we know this isn't because of that, but we know that if we change things uh, to this new reality, a whole bunch of people can be hurt or a whole bunch of people can be helped. I think the school choice movement had to face that a lot too, way back at the beginning when you, you knew the kids were failing, but you couldn't prove they'd be helped by, by reforming school. You could only prove that pub, the private schools were having a little bit better of an outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one comes from Emily in Utah. Is it best to appeal to a wide audience or pick a specific audience when planning your policy story? Great question. A lot of times organizations will say, well, I want it to appeal to everybody. That's a powerful product when I can appeal to everybody. Actually, that's a pretty weak product. So what you want to do is you want to find the most finite group that you can support, your strongest group. And no, you're not going to hit everybody, but find the group that's going to be benefited the most and tell that story. And even though everybody else may not be affected in the same way as your hero, there's great empathy that comes with story and people will feel for that person and they will fall behind it. And that's where your strength is. When your story is very specific in how it's going to help somebody, don't just say, this is going to help every American by such and such because it's probably going to be, you have to really narrow it down to somebody's specific situation to make it strong. Yeah. You know, that, that does parallel the software world. You worked in the software world, right? Yeah. yeah pretty much every time we've had to divide, just decide what a user, a user interface will be like, we're telling user stories. So we're like, I'm going to be, you know, soccer mom Sally, and this is how I'm going to interact with it. And you'd write a whole story about, about that from this one person's perspective so you could learn how that affects the whole group. Yeah. Um, does that mean, though, if we're targeting our story to one little person that we don't check it against the bigger audience? No, because you're, like, like you said, we're constantly checking, does this story move? In fact, we call this a movement. And folks, you don't have a movement unless it moves unless it moves people. And that's the power of story. Log lines, the DNA of story, they move people. So don't think you're gonna move people with just your policy. You're not. You're not gonna move the right people all the time. Okay, well, looks like we don't have any other questions. I'll give it a few more minutes because I have a question about um, how do you vet, and if somebody has a question, just drop it in that little Q&A panel. Um, so what do I do to make sure the story I think is good is really good? Because it's easy for me to think my stories are good, but sometimes I notice I put people to sleep around the campfire. Test it. Test it with somebody. Try it out with somebody. And don't just test it with people in the office. Call. I have a thing I call my mother test. My mother's 95. And whenever I'm working with a group, I will typically call my mom at night and run the message by her and run the story. And mom will say, I get it. I understand it. Or how I don't understand this particular piece. Try it on somebody that's not walking in the wonkery with you to see if everybody else gets it. Because remember, you're going to expect them to be the contagion to carry it on to other people. And if the normal person can understand it, you can't expect another person to get someone to explain something you could not. Great advice. Okay, well, Kevin, I want to thank you for being on the Spark session. And I hope everybody liked the new format. It let us know what you think about this compared to GoToWebinar. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next month at that accelerator. We get to do that one together and to reading your new book when it comes out. And again, if you're interested in hearing more about that, just uh, send me an email, Nicole at sparkfreedom.org. And 
um, you know, we're always here to help. So if you have a story idea and you can summarize it in an email, you can always shoot it to me and I'll, I'll give you the honest answer. You may not always like it, but I will give you the honest answer. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody, as we slide into the next one this, this sunny July. Bye.